Hi, everybody, and welcome to video number five from topic 9.7 out of the AP Calculus course in the exam description. We're still talking about polar equations and, and, and all of the review materials that we've uh, kind of unearthed and, and put back in front of you after a pretty long hiatus, maybe from when you first saw them in trig class. And we're going to continue to do that here. We're talking about converting. And this particular video is going to focus on the conversion from a polar equation to a rectangular equation. So let's take a look at our example number five. So in this example, it's going to ask to convert and we're going to have these polar equations, as you can see here in parts A, B, and C. And then once we convert them into the rectangular, we want to verify graphing them on, the, on a graphing calculator. And just like I did in the last video, I've already got these uh, sketched out on the calculator. I've taken the screenshots, and we'll show you exactly what they look like. But first, we want to deal with the conversion. Now, if you remember, there's a lot of different formulas that you can use. There's really four different equations that tend to find themselves tied to converting polar to rectangular and vice versa. And I'm not going to bring those equations up. We've already talked about them in a couple of videos. So I'm going to hope that at this point we have <clears throat> a little bit more of a working understanding of them. But this is where things get kind of interesting because you really have to problem solve. You might even have to do a little trial and error in order to write this equation, r equal negative cosecant theta, into an equation that has only x's and y's pretty tricky. So the thing that I would do with five part A, we like to have cosines and sines in equations as much as possible. Because if we can ever pair R up with a sine, we know that that's a Y value. If we can pair R with a cosine, we know that that is an X value. Now in this particular problem, it doesn't look like we have sine or cosine, but that is about the change when as soon as we convert our cosecant into 1 over sine. And boom, not only does that take care of getting a sine in the problem, we can cross multiply, and then we have our r multiplied by the sine. Of course, that will equal negative 1. And hopefully you will remember that r times the sine of theta is just equivalent to y. And boom, there is your rectangular equation. Now, just because it doesn't have an x in it doesn't mean it doesn't count as a rectangular equation. This is a horizontal line, and that's exactly what the graph of r equal negative cosecant is going to be. And in fact, let's go ahead and jump. I'll spoil the surprise. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next page, and you can see those two equations graphed right here. I know there's a lot going on in this page. I promise we're going to look at the other graphs here in a moment, but you've got those particular uh, equations right there sketched and you can see that they really are one and the same. I know that my scaling isn't perfect uh, to, to align the two panes of my graphing calculator, but they are in the same location nonetheless. All right, let's take a look at part B. Now in part B, maybe you're already kind of giving getting yourself ahead and thinking, oh, well, wait a minute, if I could get this r and this sine theta multiplied and this r and this cosine, maybe I've got a good chance of figuring out what's going to happen. And that's exactly right. That's the key to this problem. You want to cross multiply because you love to have r's and sines together and, of course, r's and cosines together. So if I cross multiply, I will find myself in this position right there. At that stage, the r sine theta is the y, the r cosine is the x, don't forget there still is a 3 in front, and this <clears throat> equation is perfectly suitable to be left like that if you want to get y all by itself. That's certainly allowed as well, and it looks like we have a line with a slope of negative 3 and a y-intercept of positive 2 here. So if we want to take a look, on the next page. That is indeed what we have. Here is our graph of y equal negative 3x plus 2. And then if we compare that to our 2 over sine theta plus 3 cosine theta, it is the same thing. Now I know the slopes don't look quite the same. They don't look parallel. But a lot of that has to do with these grid boxes not being aligned just perfectly. All right, last one. This one's probably going to take a little bit more effort because 
<clears throat> of the way that it's presented, but we're going to go ahead and give this a shot. Notice how cross-multiplying has been a great friend to us. I would say that we will continue that. Let's go ahead and we'll cross-multiply. So the R is going to distribute through here. Everything's going wonderfully so far. And you even start to look at this R cosine theta and think, hey, that's, that's just an X value. So let's make that happen. Let's go ahead and change that out. And we'd have R plus 2 x equal 3. Now I know that this is not what we were bargaining for because this is not a rectangular equation. This does not contain only x's and or y's. But we can make that happen because if you recall there is a handy formula that allows you to rewrite r in terms of x and y. And if you remember it's just the Pythagorean theorem square root of x squared plus y squared. So you make that switch right there, and I would say you've got a rectangular equation. Now, granted, it doesn't have y by itself. Do you have to get y by itself? Well, really, it, it kind of depends on what the directions of the problems are. Uh, many of the problems that we've been talking about really aren't going to appear on the AP calculus exam because these are all trigonometric review problems. But I think understanding what we're doing is going to lend itself very well to you being more comfortable operating in that trig calculus environment. Now, if this was a multiple choice question, let's say we get y by itself, um, you could certainly do that by just subtracting 2x over to the right side. So we'll go ahead and make that happen. And then you're going to have to probably consider getting rid of that square root. So you're going to have to square both sides. Now when you square both sides, the left side's easy to fix because the square root just disappears. The right side's going to have to undergo a little bit of foil, a little bit of expansion here. And I'll let you guys verify this if you want to pause the video to do that but I'm pretty sure that's the value that we're going to get and at this point we could go ahead and subtract the x squared over I might even rewrite the left side in a descending order and then if we want we could square root both sides and we would have to consider both the plus and minus because there's really nothing in this problem that throws out negative y values. I mean, of course, we see them all the time in polar graphs, and they're perfectly acceptable. And so I guess this would be the explicit equation for y, but the implicit equation we had as early as this step right here. Now, if we want to go ahead and take a look at our graphing page, I'll scroll down a little bit, and we find out that we have a really interesting curve here. This is indeed a hyperbola. Um, Maybe from this part here, you recognize that a hyperbola is always going to be a, a, an appearance whenever you have x squared and y squared in an equation where um, the potential is for one of those to have a negative sign. And it turns out because of the presence of this 4x squared over here, by the time I got things all on the same side, uh, I would have a negative in front of either x squared or y squared, depending on how we write, how we decide to write this. But it turns out that um, <clears throat> we would have a, a sideways opening hyperbola in this case. And so that's what we've got right here, as you can see from that equation. Well, if we go to the polar graph, 3 over 1 plus 2 cosine theta, what was originally given, we noticed that the graphing calculator kind of struggles a little bit with this. It It, it graphs this hyperbola, as we see here, but the TI Inspire can't help itself but to draw in these uh, grid lines, I guess, or these guidelines that normally would be dashed because they're not really part of the curve per se. They just sort of help build it. Just like this guy here would have those same things over here, but uh, whenever the TI Inspire graphs these uh, in rectangular, they uh, do not show up on the screen. But in any event, You've got your hyperbola depicted both in rectangular and in polar. I've always thought that these were really interesting. I really enjoy, uh, if you couldn't tell, using technology to kind of bridge the gap between polar and rectangular to really understand that they, they can coexist, and they do, and they have a lot of similar properties. They just happen to do so in a couple of different graphing environments. 
Anyway, that's it for this video. We're going to go ahead and, and uh, produce a few more videos here for you to round out the beginning parts of 9.7 and dealing with your wonderful polar review. So make sure you check them out. As always, thanks for joining.